and welcome back everyone. Um, we're in a motel in um, upstate New York with three English, two English adults, an English child and a dog. I don't recognize the man who opens the door, but Honey does. She bounds at him, launching herself through the air like a missile. Darling Honey, I hear him say, laughing. His voice cracked with emotion. Darling dog. Honey is incandescent with joy, ecstatic, and it's contagious. If I had a tail, if I had a tail I'd wag it too. At last. Matthew buries his head in her thick white ruff. He holds her face in his hands and his tired features fill with light. At last he stands up and embraces my father. Their faces disappear and the two men seem to merge. They could be twins, so similar, similar are they in height and stature. I can imagine them as children or on the side of a mountain, the closest either had to a brother. Honey stands looking up at her master, alert to every expression, every inch electric with love. She has lost the melancholic expression of the last few days. Matthew cannot resist kneeling again, and she licks his face and neck till he grasps her head in his two hands and pushes her gently away. Not content to step back, she turns sideways and rubs the length of her body across his chest, first one way, then the other. If she could eat him, she would. Matthew has strong features and unnaturally intense eyes. His hair is thick and gray. Even I can see that despite his age, he is handsome. He doesn't attempt hugging or kissing just looks at me, his head tilted slightly, watching. It is hard to get over the habit of dislike that has grown in my head, but Matthew is not what I expected. His expression is complex. He looks athletic, but holds his shoulders stiffly, as if in pain. I wish now that I hadn't sent him those texts. While he speaks to Gil, I examine his face. There are purple shadows under his eyes. He smells clean and is recently shaved. He wears a faded green flannel shirt. I expected desperation, but instead he is quiet and reserved. It is impossible to ignore the fact that he looks unspeakably sad. We sit down, me on the bed, Gil and Matthew in chairs. Matthew asks Gil if he wants a drink, doesn't wait for an answer and pours wine into two glasses. I don't need to check, check my watch. It's not yet 10 in the morning. Gil looks ill at ease. When I tune into my father, the signals all line up. Is this because I know him so well or because he has nothing left to hide? I get no signal from Matthew. What little comes through is scribbly and erratic. Everything scrambled is not the same as a lack of information. It suggests interference. Matthew's signals are blocked, as if he has a glass oops, wall buried a few inches beneath his skin. He is accustomed to hiding. It is obvious that they would like to talk without me present, but I am not in a mood to cooperate. I sit absolutely still, waiting for resolution. Matthew drinks with steady deliberation and pours another. They make small talk about our trip. Gil tells him about Linda and Jake. Matthew listens quietly, asking questions that may or may not mask a depth of emotional involvement. The mood in the room becomes increasingly odd. Honey searches Matthew's face. I do too, and am abashed suddenly to feel that I may be contributing to his unhappiness. Just as I'm trying to figure out how to excuse myself, Matthew asks if I would mind sitting in the lobby for a bit while they talk. He asks politely as to a social and intellectual equal. I appreciate this. It is not commonly the way people speak to children. Gil takes me out to the lobby, which has been designed as a pretend study with a desk, an ugly red leather sofa, a lamp, a bookshelf filled with paperback books. Strange snow light pours in through the window. No one sits in the reception area, which connects to a small office. Gil kisses the top of my head and apologizes for, well, he says, for everything. Peguntadora, he says. I'm busy collecting my things and only turn to him after a minute. Yes. Forgive me, he says. I'm trying to do what's best for everyone. I stare at him, studying his face. You didn't have to lie to me. I know, he says. I'm not an idiot. Far from it. But everyone alive has secrets, he says. It's terrible being a keeper of secrets. Worse, maybe, than being kept in the dark. I say nothing. Mila, I need your help. Like he needs to point that out. Our eyes meet again, and suddenly I feel grubby and false. I'm withholding help because it is the only power I have, except the power to be kind. 
I reach over and take his hand, the one that is not gripping his suitcase, and so the drama between us melts away. Who knows? Someday I may need him to lie for me. Thank you.